In his mission on earth, to earth, Jesus called men and women to follow him in that kingdom mission. And he calls us today. That's right. He calls you. He calls me into his kingdom mission, to be part of that mission. And there are certain essential specifications for this mission. He called his disciples 2,000 years ago, and he calls you, he calls us today, to follow him with a couple of key specifications. Now, you've got this in your sermon notes. You're going to need to fill in the blanks. This will get you focused on the sermon title today. Jesus calls you, you're a Christian? Jesus calls you to follow him on what? How do you fill in that blank? And with what? What are the answers there? He calls us to follow him on purpose. On purpose. You know, intentionally as well as having a game plan. And with power that he gives us when we take up that purpose. Jesus calls you to follow him with purpose and with power, to be Christian on purpose with power. Now, all of this may prompt you to ask the question, though, am I right now a Christian on purpose? Like, if I ask you, what's your game plan? What's your ministry game plan this afternoon and this week? What's your mission? What mission has Jesus given you? And how are you going to fulfill it? Some of us might be, well, I don't know. You know, I, I just kind of woke up. I came to church because I think I'm supposed to. No, no, no. That's not what we're talking about here. It's, here's some key indicators. Today, right now. And looking into the year ahead. Looking into the year ahead. How is my fruit? How's my fruit of repentance? of repentant renewal with Christ? How's my fruit of how I'm affecting my family and my household and other people God is placing in my life? Are they seeing the glory of God living in me because his spirit is in fact alive in me? In other words, I'm actually saved. I'm actually a born again Christian. Is that going on with you? How's my stewardship faith? And I love, like last month and this month, because it's a good indicator, what Christians and church members, what you committed to is a public profession of faith to God, to give to him, to worship him, to serve him, moving into the year ahead. That's a, you know, there's a lot of people who say, oh, I'm planning this or that for Christmas. I'm asking, what are you planning for God for the actual Christ of Christmas? And you can see, if, by the way, if you have not had a chance to do this, you're being invited right now today to actually have a living faith in Jesus, which means you then make commitments about your worship, about your giving first and best to him, including financially giving, giving other things and serving him. But here's the good news. If Jesus has called you to know him, to be saved in him, he calls you and me to be, and he can totally equip you to be what I'm talking about. Christian on purpose with power that changes lives, that changes you, that changes your household, that changes the world. Now, let's turn to our key scripture for today as we reflect on this. Luke chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. A momentous moment in the New Testament and in the Gospels as Jesus, for the first time, sends out the twelve in his mission. Listen to this. Hear now God's word. Then calling the twelve together, he, this is Jesus, gave them power and authority over all the demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out. He sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he said to them, Take nothing for the journey, nothing, neither staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not even have two tunics piece. And whatever house you may enter, remain there, and from there depart. And as for those who do not receive you, 
When you leave that town, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony, as a witness against them. Then they went out and were going through the villages, preaching the good news and healing everywhere. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. I don't know if you've noticed this, but we call this Advent season. Advent heading into the Christmas season, the 12 days of Christmas. First, we have Advent. You remember what Advent means? Let me remind you. Coming. We think about Jesus' first coming, and we look ahead to his coming again to consummate the kingdom, to judge the living and the dead, and to bring in the new Jerusalem. Now, let's think about how Jesus came. He came in mission. He was sent with clear objectives. In other words, he wasn't just down here saying, oh, this is nice, oh, what a nice beach. That's pretty. Wow, isn't it amazing how God creates things? That's, that's not what he did. He came with a clear purpose. Now, this is gonna shock you. Some of you may be Presbyterian in background, so this is gonna shock you. And, and I'm horrified by this too, I'm just amazed by this, but I have to deal with reality. I have read all four Gospels numerous times. I've studied them extensively. And from what I can see, now this is surprising to us all, Jesus did not come to call and to form a church of committees. <gasps> yes, it's true. I, I, I challenge you to read through all four Gospels, and never does Jesus say, I have been sent to form a well-functioning church of a whole bunch of committees with a great committee structure. Peter, James, John, let me get your input, because I'm interested in your input for vision casting, and then we're going to do an organizational chart that is nowhere in the Gospels. Presbyterians don't have a heart attack. I, I am here to lay hands on you if you're having a heart attack right now, but it's true. Nor, and by the way, if you want a really good committee system, I invite you into the Chinese Communist Party. They've got, and the former Soviet Union had a great, I mean, just like loads of webs of committees, and they have great committee meetings because when President Xi says something that's gonna happen, the committee like all agrees and they vote unanimously on everything, and it's really cool. If you want committees, go to the Chinese Communist Party. That's not what Jesus came to bring. He's not that kind of leader. He's not that kind of savior. Nor did Jesus train his disciples to be chair sitters, or if you will, pew sitters, to be club creators. I'm just going to kind of create a club with people I know and like and went to fraternity with, uh, you know, at Mississippi State. No, no, not a club. And definitely not complainers. If you've ever actually read the Bible, this strikes me all the time, all the way from the Old Testament, particularly with Moses, all the way through the New Testament. Complainers are condemned. Did you know that? Now, I, I run into people in my entire ministry that think their job as a Christian is to come up after worship and complain to me about something. I mean, it's just amazing. It's like, you, this is not what Jesus came to equip. Yes, I, if you want a whole group of complainers, join the Pharisees. In other words, Jesus did not come to create us to be Pharisees. The Pharisees don't like Jesus, and Jesus doesn't applaud that whole critique thing going on with the Pharisees. His advent, his coming, his mission is this. It's the key verse I've been telling you over and over again as we move through Luke. We're going to get it fairly late in Luke at the end of his journey toward Jerusalem. Luke chapter 19, verse 10, at the close of when he goes to Zacchaeus' house. He says, Jesus says, for the Son of Man came. Why did he come? What's the advent about? To seek and to save the lost. That's why he's born in Bethlehem. That's what's going on here. His mission was on purpose, that purpose, to seek and to save the lost. Another passage from Luke chapter 4, verse 43. Jesus says, they want to keep him in Capernaum. Everything's going great. He says, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God in other towns as well because I was sent. Did you catch that? I was sent. This is the mission. For this purpose. Notice Jesus is really fixed on his purpose. He's not wasting time down here on earth. You shouldn't be either. Mission on purpose. But you could say, well, what about power, Pastor? Because I'm actually 
theologically astute. I study the Old Testament, and I know that, for instance, in Philippians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul says that in coming, in his incarnation, Jesus emptied himself and became one of us. Well, here's the power answer, and it goes back to the purpose, too. It puts the two of them together. His inaugural, Jesus' inaugural sermon in the synagogue at Nazareth when he quotes from Isaiah 61, verses 1 into 2. And he tells you why and how he's the anointed, the Christ. To be the Christ, to be the Messiah means you're anointed. as the king, the priest, the prophet. Here's what he says. The spirit of the Lord is upon, upon me because he has anointed me. Did you catch that? Here's the Christ. Okay. He has anointed me to announce good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and to the blind recovery of sight, to send out the oppressed in freedom, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, in other words, the Jubilee year. And the power to meet this purpose, to fulfill this purpose comes because even though he's emptied himself and become one of us, it's not just that he's the son of God, he has yielded himself and the spirit empowers him. The spirit of the Lord is upon me, the third person of the Trinity. So by this anointing in the spirit of God, Christ had power to fulfill his purpose and he's showing you and me that even though obviously we're not the son of God, we can receive power by his spirit in us. So Jesus was and is the Christ, the anointed of God on purpose with power. And in his mission, Jesus calls men and women in his kingdom to be with him in the kingdom mission on purpose with power. If you are a Christian, if you would raise your hand, if I said if you are a Christian, then you are called into mission with purpose and power. Who is Christian on purpose with power? Well, again, we got some key indicators, right? Am I really a Christian on purpose with power? Well, my fruit is going to reflect that. Bible all the way through the New Testament tells us that. My fruit, what happens in my life, what happens as I interact with others. My stewardship faith, my commitment, including my commitment to, to serve and to give. My witness, how I name the name of Jesus and share his gospel with others or fail to do that. That's going to be a key indicator. How I share healing grace from him. Joel Green, in his really good commentary, the Gospel of Luke, I won't make you read through the whole thing. I'll just go ahead and take you to page 352. He says this, you cannot know Christ, his person and his work, apart from engaging you personally in discipleship. It's not just a thought. Well, let me read some things about Jesus. You have to get involved as a disciple. You have to be involved in the ministry, in his mission. And here's the good news. Every born again Christian, every born a new Christian by the Spirit has purpose and power. I've already talked about those, but we're gonna see in our scripture some more things. Provision, prophetic presence, and even participation in Christ. It's incredible. What's in there in Luke chapter 9, verses 1 through 6? So let's go back and remember where we are in Luke's gospel. In Luke chapter 4, again, I've mentioned this, we're taught that Jesus began his public ministry proclaiming the good news of the kingdom in word and in actions, in word and in deed. He doesn't just talk about it. He doesn't just proclaim the gospel. He makes it happen as people are healed, as lives are saved, as people come to faith. Uh, he does this with authority and power, including, and Luke really highlights this, the other gospel writers do, over demons and unclean spirits and over diseases. Because this is telling you that the gospel is an all-inclusive salvation, okay? And that God is through the seed of the woman taking on the seed of the serpent. He's taking out the devil's reign. It's Genesis 3.15. Jesus is the guy who is fulfilling the prophecy in Jesus 3.15, okay? This is what's going on. Now, here's a classic verse. Luke 6, 36, uh, 4.36. Luke 4.36. And they were all amazed and said to one another, what is this word? In other words, this guy preaches, but he casts out demons. With authority and power. Do you see that? 
with authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits and they come out. In other words, he has authority over the devil's people, over the devil's troops. This is incredible. Now, we've also seen in the first cycle of Jesus' public ministry, which is Luke chapters 4 through 7, his proclamation of the gospel of the kingdom with power and word and deed, including, it included beginning to call and to train some disciples. We get that in the first cycle. Uh, in fact, he even calls and begins to train some guys that he sets off apart and names as apostles. Now, some of you are studying through Matthew's gospel right now, and I have to tell you, in Matthew, Mark, and John, the term apostolos is only used one each in each of those gospels. So you may not be that familiar with the term. Apostolos means sent one. Apostoloi means sent ones. Those who are sent from the boss or the king. Okay? Now, in Paul's letters, the term apostolos is used 34 times. 34 times. Paul uses apostle all over the place. And if you're a Bible nerd, you're going to like this. In Luke's books, Luke and Acts, Luke also uses the term, guess how many times? 34 also. Isn't that interesting? 34 apostles in both Paul's writings and Luke's writings. But back in the Gospel of Luke, we've read already back in cycle one of Jesus' public ministry in chapter six of Luke, that Jesus calls and sets apart these apostles. And that means sent ones. Now, just think a minute. If I were a football coach and I were rounding up a team and I said, you're going to be a receiver. You know, receiver is short for pass receiver. I am naming you guys over here. Patsy, Hunter, you guys are my receivers, my pass receivers. And then we have all these practices and all we ever do is just stay in the huddle and don't do very much, right? I mean, I'm doing a lot as the coach, but y'all haven't gone out for a pass yet. This begs the question, hey, coach, when are the receivers going to actually run down the field and go out for a pass, right? When are you going to send them out on a route? Do you all get this? The question is also begged. Jesus, all the way back in Luke 6, has called these guys to be his sent ones, but he hasn't sent them yet. Now we finally get to it in Luke chapter 9. Um, when and how the king of kings sends his ambassadors. Now let's remember where we are in the gospel. Again, as I've mentioned, we're in the second cycle of Jesus' public ministry. He's really gearing up the church now because he isn't going to be here forever. He's going to get ready at the end of this cycle to head for Jerusalem where slowly but surely he's making his way to die on the cross. Okay, So he's got to get these guys up and at them. Second cycle of Jesus' public ministry before he sets his face toward Jerusalem in Luke chapter 9, verse 51. We've been focusing on this thing, how Jesus is preparing his disciples to be his church in mission and to lead his church in mission. Is that just something 2,000 years ago? No, this pertains to you and me too, if we're Christian, if we're the church. To be Christian on purpose with power. Now, a couple weeks ago, Dean preached a sermon, an excellent sermon called Genuine Saving Faith, because we're really getting this focus on faith with this, to actually believe and to give all in on Jesus in worship, in giving, in serving with all their hearts. We see these women who are publicly and privately supporting financially with all their means. I mean, they're giving. Do you give? Do you give to the mission? They're giving everything. These, these folks who come to faith, they, they turn their lives over to Jesus. And again, remember, in the first cycle of his public ministry, Jesus proclaims the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom, in word and action, and he delivers people from demons and from disease. Now, this is awesome. In the middle of the second cycle of his ministry, after he's geared these guys up, he sends them to do the same mission. Do you hear what I'm saying? He sends these like ordinary guys to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God arriving in Jesus and to deliver people from demons and to heal them from diseases. It's the midpoint of cycle two, uh, Luke nine, one through six. He gives power and authority to the 12 and sends them on the same mission. You, you understand this? We're not called to be spectators. 
if, if I get you guys out at Davis Wade Stadium 50 times, does that make you a football player who's actually on the football team? I've watched this, yeah, and I've applauded when good things happen. That does not make you a football player, okay? You've actually got to get in the field. Now he gives them power and authority to get in the field, and they're going to continue his mission. Jesus gives them purpose and power and promises them some other things. Provision, prophetic presence, and participation in Jesus himself and his mission. Okay, let's look at this. Verses 1 through 2. Purpose and power. And then calling the 12. Remember, right before then, Jesus has broken off for the first time ever in his Gospels, in his Gospel ministry. He's broken off Peter, James, and John to see his raising Jairus' his daughter from the dead. Okay? So we got the 12, but we got the inner three. He's starting to identify an inner three, too. Now he pulls back and calls all 12 to himself. Um, calling the 12. Why 12? Why 12 apostles? How many tribes of Israel? How many tribes of Israel? Twelve. Is Jesus establishing the renewed or new Israel? Absolutely. Will his apostles judge the tribes of Israel? Yes, we read that in you know, the Gospels and Revelation, right? So we've got twelve for a reason, and they represent Israel, the new Israel, just like the tribes represented original Israel. You may remember in Numbers chapter 13, when we send out the initial crew on the mission to look at the promised land, remember Moses sends out how many scouts? How many spies? Twelve. One from each tribe. How many is Jesus sending out for the initial foray in his mission? Twelve. Does that mean only the twelve spies were ever going to go into the promised land? No. We're all supposed to go in. They're cutting the path for us. This is what's going on here. The 12 represent the new church, the new Israel in mission. Uh, Luke 9, 1 through 49, focusing on the 12. Just a little footnote here. I thought this is interesting when I realized this. Either as a group, referring to the 12 or the apostles, or individually to individually named apostles, we get 12 of those. 12 mentions by Luke in Luke 9, 1 through 49. The central focus is definitely supposed to be on Jesus, but we're supposed to be paying attention to the 12. Now, the 12 do have a unique role on the one hand, but like I said, on the other hand, the 12 represent and cut a path that you're supposed to follow. You, yes, Christian. Christian's purpose and Christian's power. Now, again, back to verses 1 and 2. He gave them power and authority over all the demons and to cure diseases, and he sent them to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Now, that's their purpose, that's their power. Let's go to further provision. How does the king send his emissaries? In really highly bedecked, beautiful clothing and lots of jewelry and all kinds of gifts to give to all the people they're going to go visit? Here's a housewarming gift. No, he sends them with nothing. This is not the way normal kings send their ambassadors, but this is the way Jesus sends his people. Take nothing for the journey. I'm not going to get into the weeds of the details here, but basically the overall structure here, and it's consistent. He's going to change this over time when he sends out the 70 or the 72. We'll get to that in a few weeks, and then later, certainly after the resurrection. But in general, the theme is this. If you go as a Christian, you're not supposed to pack up everything and figure out how you're going to provide for yourself. You're supposed to step out in faith. You're, you're not going to know everything. Well, I don't like that. I know your flesh doesn't like that. My flesh doesn't like that. I'm just telling you. Hey, have you ever stepped out in faith before? This is what he's telling these guys. You take nothing. I'm going to provide. But, but I'm not going to drop it from the sky. I'm going to provide through people. And that then leads us to uh, this going in faith, um, not in your own power, leads us to understand this about our Christian provision. You may know this, you may not. To be saved, we are saved by faith alone in Christ alone. Did you know that? If you're trying to trust in yourself, you're not going to be saved. You have to believe in Christ alone. Okay? As a Christian, you are called and I'm called to live in faith alone, in Christ alone also. That's the way he sends out his apostles. In faith alone. In Christ alone. 
Now let's look at their prophetic presence. These are both people who receive them and financially support them and people who do not. That's what's going on here. That's what Jesus is talking about. There are going to be some people who welcome you and who support you for your mission in their area. And there are some people who will not. And Jesus says, for the people who don't welcome you and who don't support, who are not willing to support, who are not willing to welcome. Here's what Jesus says. He says, you have a prophetic presence. And this is up to this very day. You know, God calls me in different ministries. I always know God. Hey, it's, it's an opportunity for folks. It's an opportunity for us to support his ministry or to reject supporting his ministry. So Jesus says for the folks who reject, who do not welcome, who do not support you as you come into the mission field that they are in. You shake the dust off of your feet, Jesus says. As a witness, literally the Greek here, maturion, means witness. And this really hit me because you know how we're sent as witnesses? We're sent as witnesses to bring people to trust in Christ. But we can also be a witness that brings condemnation against them because if they do not receive us, if they do not support the mission and the ministry, it's a witness against them. That's what Jesus says. That's kind of an Advent message there, but it hit me from this scripture, okay? Now, then, finally, our participation. We participate in Christ and in his mission to save others and by the grace of God and eternal inheritance. This is what the New Testament is telling us. They departed and went out preaching the gospel. The Greek here, it's not kind of like a verb and an object. Euangelizomai, okay? It means to evangelize. They went out evangelizing. It's a verb. They departed and preaching the gospel, evangelizing people and healing everywhere. So back to us now. Right now, ask yourself this. Am I a Christian on purpose? Do I know what God wants me to do this week? And am I committed to it? Or am I just floating through life? I want to invite you to be a Christian on purpose, to believe in Jesus and therefore to engage in his mission. What's my fruit? What's my stewardship faith as I head into the new year? I'm not talking about what you're planning to spend on yourself for Christmas. I'm talking about giving to the living Christ of Christmas. What's my witness? Here's the good news. True Christians worship, give, serve on purpose with power and not mere talk. This is what the Apostle Paul says. Here's what he says about the kingdom of God. Listen to this. 1 Corinthians 4.20. The kingdom of God does not consist in talk. It's not about showing up and saying some words on a screen. But in power. The kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. And Christ will give you that. I want to invite you into the power that he wants to give you, the purpose he wants to give you, to trust him for the provision. And understand, you have a prophetic presence. And by the grace of God, you do and will participate in his mission and the rewards of heaven. Because knowing him is never divorced from living engaged discipleship. Or let me put it really simply. As John Ortberg classically says, if you want to walk on water, what do you need to do? Get out of the boat. If you want to walk on water, get out of the boat. Get going. Notice Jesus sent them. He's sending you today as you come to worship. So here's the thing. Invite Jesus to give you purpose and power, to provide for you, to give you that prophetic presence and to participate in his mission and in his glorious grace. Believe Jesus, join him in his mission and be a Christian on purpose with power. Power that lasts forever. In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, now and forever, amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org give to give.